invitation Hearkening to the voice of my cry My King and my God We have a God who hears our prayers. We have a God who understands the struggles we go through. A God who has come down in the flesh and he has experienced everything that we go through. And that is reason enough for us to bring our petitions to him. Okay, so let's make this prayer from our hearts that he would be our vision and he would be the leading light and guide for my soul, for our souls this morning. Don't be 
Can I ask uh, Annie to lead us in prayer? Annie, would you lead us in prayer? Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Lord, for this wonderful time that you have given us, O Master, to come together in your presence, uh, to worship you and to study the word of God. Thank you, Lord. Help us to know more about you. Um, and uh, leave the section in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Right. So good morning once again. And thank you for joining us on this Saturday morning as we go through the book of Genesis. Right. So we have been going through the book of Genesis. Our, our focus has been to complete Genesis 1 to 11. And we have reached uh, chapter nine and uh, we'll be looking at chapter nine ending and chapter 10 today right chapter nine ending and chapter 10 today all right last week we saw an incident that happened in the life of noah and his sons after the flood post flood noah decides to do some cultivation and he chooses to cultivate uh, the wine and he cultivates good wine and he he gets drunk and we see that one of his sons ham actually saw him naked or uncovered in his tent and then he sort of makes fun of it he goes and tells his brothers what he saw and this was kind of a disgrace shame to his father but uh, both the other sons shame and japhet they do something very wise. They take a cloth and uh, they hold both sides of the cloth and they go reverse without looking at his nakedness. They go into his tent and they cover up his nakedness. That is where we saw last time. And today I told you we will be looking at the, the curse of Noah. And we will also be looking at the generations of the nations that is coming in chapter 10. Right, so I'm going to read from verse uh, chapter 9, verse uh, 24 onwards. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of shame, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth. And let him dwell in the tents of shame, and let Canaan be his servant. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Okay, so <clears throat> our man Noah started out very well, a righteous man. But the last 350 years of his life, uh, that is total of 950 he lived. But nothing great is said about his life after that. Okay, so uh, that is the that is the inglorious way or not so remarkable way how Noah's life ends. That's what the Bible tells us. So we should understand that uh, this incident was very crucial in the lives of um, Noah and his descendants. Okay, now let's look at the. Uh, the detail about this curse. Now, God is not a God who curses people uh, for the sins of their former generations. Okay. But then God does tell us about the consequence of our sin lasting for generations. Okay. 
So, uh, a person's sin has a lasting consequence or it can carry forward to the next generation. You know, people who, who uh, you know, live immoral lives and they get, uh, you know, uh, sexually transmitted diseases and uh, they can pass it on to the unborn baby and that baby lives with the curse, you know. Not the baby's fault, but what has been passed on as a consequence of the sin lived by his parents. Okay, so it can happen, uh, you know, uh, hereditary, it can happen uh, as passing on through generation to generation. But God is not a God who uh, demands uh, justice from the grandchildren for what the grandfather did. So it is the consequence of sin that is being carried forward. Now, in this case, the grand, the uh, Ham was the father of Canaan. So Canaan was cursed. And uh, why, why is Canaan cursed and not Ham? Ham is the person who saw uh, Noah naked, but he is not the one who is cursed. But we see the curse on Canaan. Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. Now, let's look at this. This concept a little more. It was Noah's son that caused shame for his father. And the curse is something of a return to that. And that is like saying Ham's son will cause shame for his father. See, it is the father who is ashamed of the way the sons behave. Okay, So uh, as a father, Noah was ashamed at the way that Ham, his son, behaved. So Ham would feel the same pain, same shame as his when his son is, uh, you know, is, is, uh, is living out what, uh, you know, the, the uh, what uh, Noah is pronouncing here. OK, so it is in that context that uh, that shame is passed on or the curse is passed on. OK, so it is not that God is going to demand, uh, you know, account of Canaan because of something that his father did. It is the shame of the father that is being passed on to Ham. The shame of Noah, which he experienced when his son saw him naked and mocked him to his brothers, the same way Ham would feel the hurt and the pain and the shame that comes with his son living as servant to the others. Okay, so uh, what was his sin? Ham's sin was, he told, you know, uh, the... the uh, uh, you, if you look on, on top of it, it says, uh, and Ham, the father of Karan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. So it is indicative of something negative. It's like told with delight what he saw in his father's tent. So he determined to mock his father and undermine his authority as a man of God. And that could be the reason for the curse on his descendants. Okay. So how did Noah come to know this? Naturally, when he had woken up from his uh, sleep or his drunken state, his other sons would have told him, you know. So uh, it was uh, uh, it was more than, you know, just uh, his son or grandson. Maybe Canaan was also there when Ham saw him naked. Uh, and uh, we don't know the intensity of it, but we understand that uh, the, the, the strength of the curse is explained in those two verses. Okay, so uh, it seems uh, it seems strange that uh, Ham sinned against Noah, but Ham's son is cursed. But maybe Canaan was also involved, and uh, it is not mentioned in the text. Maybe the punishment is strong against Ham because prophetically Noah was telling him something that would take place in the life of his descendant Canaan. Okay. It is a prophecy that is going to be fulfilled. Now, uh, okay, uh, like uh, Ezekiel, uh, I want you to turn to Ezekiel. That is where this uh, passage comes for uh, generational curses. You know, people use this as a, 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 what do you say, for justifying generational curses in the Bible. Turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 2 and 3. Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 2 and 3. <clears throat> what do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. 
as I live, declares the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. The souls of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. Okay. So, in a way, this is not a curse about, you know, because you did this, this is going to happen to your children. This is a prophetic way of telling them that this is how your success are going to be. See? So, uh, the idea, the concept is that it is a curse, but the curse is only revealed, which means what is going to happen to the descendants is only revealed through that curse that this is how it is going to work out. And the shame of that event is coming to the father of those descendants. Okay, And thereby, it will cause shame and hurt to Ham. Okay, now, why is this so important? This is so important because throughout of history, Throughout human history, uh, whenever you know the slave trade was prominent in the earlier generations, there was a lot of slave trade. People prejudiced uh, black people, okay? black people from Africa and south of Asia. You know, people were sold as slaves because they were said to be under the curse of Canaan. Now, this was a false justification for slavery. They were trying to make this verse come true because they wanted slaves. Okay? So it was the wrong way of misinterpreting the Bible and misinterpreting and applying the Bible to a race, to a tribe and making them slaves of other people. God has deemed them to be slaves. God had never planned like that. God had never planned. This was not black people that the Bible was talking about. Okay, So actually Canaan was the father of the eastern people okay so uh, this was the time when joshua came with his army when israel was being freed and they came to canaan joshua and with uh, the whole of israel when he took the promised land all canaan the people who were occupying canaan were beaten that time okay so canaan was the father of the eastern people eastern tribes and most of them were conquered during israel uh, Israel's taking or conquering of the promised land. Okay, But later on, centuries later, the English and the Europeans used this verse as a justification for slave trade. Okay, That is why this verse is very, very important and they have been misinterpreting and misquoting it just to justify slave trade. Right? So, uh, it, it cannot be used that way. That is what I wanted to tell you. It cannot be used that way to justify slave trade. All right, and finally, we see the blessing that is given to the others. Blessed be the Lord, the God of shame. Let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of shame. And let Canaan be his servant. See, twice it is mentioned about Canaan being the servant. Actually, three times it is mentioned. You would see it in verse 25, verse 26, and verse 27. Three times it is mentioned about Canaan being their slaves. Okay. So, uh, it was something about a revelation that was happening to, about to come from the future. Right. Okay. Uh, so, I hope you have understood this much and we'll continue into the... Now, why is it uh, significant for us in chapter 10? See, that gives us an idea about the next nations. Okay. Uh, uh, chapter 10 is about the nations that descended from these three uh, you know, uh, families. Shem, Japheth and uh, Canaan. Now, three of them, uh, it is going to impact them in the way that they are going to go forward in the coming generations. And that is why this prophecy is very, very important. For prophecy is very, very important. Okay. Now, I told you these are the only recorded words of Noah in scripture. Okay. So, the only recorded words of Noah in scripture. So, the word curse is only used once, but it's directed at Ham's youngest son, Canaan, and not directly at Ham himself. Okay, So he was describing the future of his sons and one grandson on the basis of what he saw in the character of Ham. Okay, okay. So he saw something in the character of Ham. That is what he prophesied about. What was the first one? You will find that it was enslavement. See, um, Looking down through the centuries, Noah predicted three times that the descendants of Canaan would be the 
servants. Canaanites are listed in Genesis chapter 10, verse 15 onwards. You'll find Canaan fathered Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, and the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Girgashites, and Hubites, Archites, the Sinites. Okay, you list the whole thing there. And then you see verse 19. And the territory of the Canaanites extended from Sidon in the direction of Gerar as far as Gaza, and in the direction of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Jeboim as far as Lasha. These are the sons of Ham by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. Okay, and their nations. Now, uh, God warned the Jews when they were entering into Canaan land not to live the way of the Canaanites. Not to live the uh, what? Why? Why was the what was wrong with the Canaanite way of living? It is explained that they are full of idolatry. They worship uh, the false gods. Their way of sacrificing is they even sacrifice the children to false gods. And this is something that the Israelites should not copy. Okay. So what was it talking about? It was talking about the decay in their culture, decay in their moral setup that was going to happen to their tribes. Or their people. Okay, so the laws that are going to be given in Leviticus, uh, if you check Leviticus chapter 18, it will give you an idea about how God wanted the Israelites to live. Okay, Leviticus chapter 18. And he did not want the Jews to compromise with the Canaanite way of life. So he would command the Jews to destroy everything that would tempt them in that direction. You will find that in Exodus chapter 34 and uh, Deuteronomy chapter 7. Exodus chapter 34 and Deuteronomy chapter 7. Destroy everything that would tempt you in the direction of Canaanite form of worship. Canaanite way of living. Okay. Now, uh, second is shame. Okay. Shame is blessed with enrichment enrichment means uh, god is blessing them with riches god is blessing them with success god is blessing them to be above his brother ham's descendants okay now uh, if you look at that uh, you know uh, that uh, blessing towards shame you'll find something very very interesting okay blessed be the lord the god of shame see noah didn't bless Shame actually. He blessed the Lord, the God of shame. Noah was giving glory to God for what he will do to the descendants of shame. Okay? Noah was giving glory to God for what God is going to do to the descendants of shame. So Noah is acknowledging before his sons that whatever shame gets, whatever shame will possess you know, later on, it would be God's gift. It would be God's gift. Okay? Whatever blessing, shame is going to bring to the world in the future, it would be totally by the grace of God. Totally by the grace of God. See? Now, if you look at the history, you would find shame is the ancestor of Abraham. Okay. And uh, uh, chapter 11, you know, uh, it tells you about the, uh, the successors. And uh, verse 26 of chapter 11 tells you, when Terah had lived 70 years, he fathered Abram, Nahor, and Paran. Okay. So you find that he is, Shem is the ancestor of Abraham, who is the founder of the Hebrew nation. So Noah was talking about the Jewish people. And the Lord is going to bless the Jewish people spiritually as promised to Abraham in chapter 12. Okay. So in the book of Romans, Paul explains this process by which God chose one nation to bring Jesus Christ into the world. Totally God's grace okay so uh, uh, if you look at the word shame the name shame shame means uh, in hebrew it means name okay it means name so shame the word shame means name what does it mean uh, to be called the name it is uh, the people of israel uh, the this shame's descendants are going to preserve the name of the Lord. They're going to preserve the name of the Lord. That is what is indicative of that. And through his line only, Jesus Christ is going to come. Okay. 
Now, Bible tells us that after last week we saw shame was Noah's second born son. See? So, wherever the three sons are listed, shame's name is first. Shame Hamanyape. So, as a leader, you know, the, the younger will serve the elder. No, sorry. The elder will serve the younger. That pr principle is also fulfilled by, by denoting that shame to be a blessing over the others. Okay, so God chose Abel instead of Cain, Isaac instead of Ishmael, Jacob instead of Esau. Okay, Paul explains the same truth in Romans chapter 9. Okay, I'll say it again. The principle of God choosing not the first. Okay, uh, so that is to follow the examples of Abel instead of Cain. Isaac instead of Ishmael and Jacob instead of Esau. This is explained in Romans chapter 9. Second born taking precedence over the first born. Okay. It is indicative of the second Adam being superior to the first Adam. Adam of the Garden of Eden, Jesus Christ as the second Adam. Okay. Indicative of that. Romans chapter 9. So, shame is enrichment, Canaan enslavement. Now, if you look at history, you will find the evil ways of the nations that come after this, the Tower of Babel and all that, you will find it has to do with Ham, Ham and his descendants. Okay? So, uh, they had the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Egyptians, all come as descendants of Ham. Now, if you look at history, uh, our secular history, you will find that great things came out of these civilizations. Babylonian civilization, Assyrian civilization, Egyptian civilization. See, so they, though the curse is that they would serve the others, we see that these civilizations thrived and a lot of good things for the world came through these civilizations. Okay, so we can say like just like how those uh, Cain's descendants brought a lot of, uh, what do you call it, um, gifts to the world, you know, by like mu bringing music and by, like bringing that and this, you know, many things that they brought in to the world. The same way, Ham's descendants, they, they, they spawned great civilizations and they brought great things to the world. So worldly blessing came from Canaan's descendants. Babylonians, Assyrians, and Egyptians. Spiritual blessings came from Shem's descendants. Abraham, Israel, Jesus Christ. Okay? So, in that way, spiritual blessings came to Shem. Worldly blessings came to Canaan. Then let's look at Japheth. Now, he was the ancestor of what we call the Gentile nations. Now, uh, the Hebrew name Japheth is very close to the word to enlarge. Okay, So Japheth stands for enlargement. The Ham tribe of people, Ham group of people, they built large civilizations in the east. Okay, But the descendants of Japheth, they spread out more further than their relatives. They reached all the way towards Asia Minor and Europe. They were a people who would multiply and they would claim new territories. So Japheth stands for enlargement. Okay. So uh, they were successful in their uh, in their uh, wars. They would uh, take play, you know, authority when it came to uh, uh, when it comes to brute power and uh, land. They would go farther and wider than both the others. Okay. So that is enlargement. Ancestor of what we call the European and Asia Minor settlements. Okay, all the nations that come towards the east and come towards the northern part of Europe. Okay, that is how they settled. So, uh, with regard to spiritual uh, things, they would be dependent on shame. So, God is the God of shame and the descendants of Japheth would find God in the tents of shame. See, may God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of shame and let Canaan be his servant. See, so if with spiritual things, 
Japheth has to depend on shame. Okay, so God is the God of shame, and the descendants of Japheth would find God in the tents of shame. So Israel was chosen to by God to be the light to the nations, the Gentile nations, for the salvation of the Jews. Was the plan that God implemented to bring salvation to the whole world? Okay, through the Jews, God planned that salvation would reach the Gentiles. Okay, now you look at history and you will find that Israel failed. Israel failed as a witness to the Gentile nations. So uh, they did not believe in the true and living God, and God had to use these civilizations. You know. He had to use Babylonians, Assyrians, Egyptians to teach Israel a lesson. Okay, so very significant. We say that the nation was cursed, but the descendants were used by God as instruments of punishment when Israel, the chosen ones, became wayward. They started worshiping the wrong gods. They started following the culture of the locals, and that was reflected. And God used those nations, who were supposed to be servants, He used them to make Israel their servants. See, a lesson that was taught by the uh, to the Jews by using the Gentiles. Okay, now when Jesus came to the world, what did He bring? Let's check Luke, the Gospel of Luke, and chapter two, Luke chapter two. Okay, turn with me to Luke chapter two and verse thirty-two. This is the promise about Jesus that is declared by this, uh, you know, this um, man of God uh, at the temple. He says here, um, Lord, uh, verse thirty-two: A light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Simeon, this old man who uh, who says, "My eyes have seen the glory," is making the statement about Jesus. He has brought light to the Gentiles. See, now when Jesus brought the light to the Gentiles through the Jewish nation, and the apostles they carried the light to the nations. See? Jesus said, "Go into all the world." See? So, descendants of Noah's three sons were represented in the early church. You would see the Ethiopian eunuch, okay, descendant of Ham. Paul, descendant of Shem, and Cornelius and his family, descendants of Japheth. Okay, I'll say it again: the Ethiopian eunuch, descendant of Ham; Paul, a descendant of Shem; and Cornelius and his family. Acts chapter ten, descendants of Japheth. All three represented in the early church. Okay, so this is in context. Of how the nations spanned out after uh, Noah's time. Okay, now as we look at the details of this chapter, we have to draw some spiritual lessons from it. Okay, but we have to have some warnings also. See, this listing is not a typical genealogy that give, that only gives the names of descendants. See, these ancient people there they had their own clans. And they had their own languages, they had their own territories, and they had their own nations. Okay, so if you look at chapter ten, it is a genealogy plus an atlas plus a history book. Okay, I'll say it again. This chapter ten is a genealogy plus an atlas and a history book. We are watching the movements of people throughout. The nations of the ancient world. Okay, so we get a, a view of you know how the people settled and how the descendants were going to work out throughout the history of Israel. Now God is going to focus on one history only, that is Shem's. Okay, but the other two would be in the background. Secular history teaches us about it, and in between they interlink. You know they have crossovers when Babylon comes in, Assyria comes in, Egypt comes in, and all those crossing will happen. But the main focus would be on Shem's descendants. Okay. Now the listing is also not complete because we don't find nations like Edom, Moab, 
you know uh, all those nations which are later on mentioned in the book of uh, genesis and exodus you don't find those nations listed in this list okay edom moab ammon all those nations are not mentioned in this book in this genealogy okay but uh, you know those you know, those nations are important for biblical history edom is important moab is important if you look at the history of ruth you'll find that moab is very very important but the there are 70 nations that are listed in this whole list okay 70 nations are listed in this whole list so there is an arrangement that is deliberate okay but uh, you know uh, if you look at the history of uh, jacob's family there were 70 persons in jacob's family when they went to egypt okay so significant is the number 70 the lord sent 70 disciples out to preach in the world you know so something about this number 70 is significant 70 nations listed in this chapter 70 descendants or family members of jacob going into egypt 70 of the lord's evangelists going out into the world okay so something has to do with the number 70 very significant then it is difficult to identify these nations in the modern times today which are these you know where is the hamites and where are the zemarites we don't know okay only very few of them can be identified why because throughout history nations can change their names they can move from one location to another war can displace some nations natural calamities can displace nations okay so they can move from one location to another they can change their language because centuries have passed they may not be even the greek that was spoken during the biblical times is not the greek that is spoken now you see so the languages can be modified so by intermarriage you know by having alliances with the neighbors whole racial composition can be changed see so it is very difficult to identify some of these nations in the modern times why because over the centuries changes have taken place by location language racial composition due to marriage intermarriage okay so it is very difficult to identify most of these nations today okay so if somebody says so and so it could be purely speculative it cannot be uh, you know adhigarika matter we cannot say with force that this is that nation or this is this group okay only very few of them can be traced to the ancient setting okay now uh, let me look at uh okay not the list of it but uh, you know you can read the list the names but some names are very very important okay some names are very very important now uh if you find uh, verse 6 you will find um, the sons of ham kush egypt put and canaan the sons of kush seba havila sapta uh, rama and septika sons of rama sheba and dinan kush fathered nimrod he was the first on earth to be a mighty man he was a mighty hunter before the lord therefore it is said like nimrod a mighty hunter before the lord the beginning of his kingdom was babel irak akkad and kalne in the land of shinar okay now the bible as it lists these descendants of ham suddenly puts up a bracket a parenthesis we call it to discuss one man a famous man okay so this famous man his name is nimrod he was the founder of a great empire the bible says he is mentioned because he is he the nation that he founded plays an important part in the history of israel it is because of babel that is discussed in the next chapter next section of genesis that this man is very very important okay now what is nimrod called in the king james version nimrod is called a mighty one in the earth okay in my bible it says a mighty hunter before the lord mighty refers to a champion okay champion somebody who is superior in strength superior in courage that is what mighty translates to okay uh, if you look at a mighty men of david which means they were superior in strength superior in courage willing to do anything for the king okay? mighty men 
So David's special bodyguards were called the mighty men of David. Now image of Nimrod in the text is not like a sportsman hunting, you know, uh, hunting deer or hunting animals. No, but the picture that the Bible gives us about Nimrod is a ruthless leader who is like a dictator, okay? who is like a dictator. He is, he will go to any lengths to establish his empire. He built four cities in Shinar okay, and four more in Assyria. Both Babylon and Assyria became enemies of Israel. Was, they were used by God, I said, to discipline or correct Israel. Okay, So uh, as we read uh, the Tower of Babel, we will do uh, an extensive study on Nimrod. But understand that the word that is used here is of an evil dictator, a tyrant who would go to any lengths to establish his empire. Okay, so what is the significance of all these names? Now, these names carry some theological truths. What is that? The first truth is that God, Yahweh, is the Lord of the nations. Okay, uh, uh, the, the understanding, number one, is that Yahweh is the God who is the Lord of the nations. God gave their nations their inheritance. He determined, you know, before the, uh, the, the times that were appointed for these nations, how long they will live, how long they will rule, how long they will conquer, how much land they will possess. All these things have been appointed by God. He gave them their boundaries and where they can live. It is determined by God and God alone. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 8. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance. Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 8. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, okay, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the people according to the number of the sons of God. So when the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance. So God is the one who divides. God is the one who determines which nation's border is supposed to be where. It is appointed by God. Turn with me to Acts chapter 17. Book of the Acts of the Apostles chapter 17. Okay, Acts of the Apostles chapter 17 and verse 26. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. Okay. He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. What the purpose is that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him. Yet he is actually not far away from each one of us. Okay. So God had a purpose for this division. God had a purpose for assigning land. God had a purpose for assigning their boundaries. See, So in spite of leaders like Nimrod, Jehovah or Yahweh God is the God of geography. Okay. And he is not only the God of geography, he is the God of history. He is the one who is in control. What God promises, he does it. See, so all the prophecy about Noah and about uh, you know Ham's descendants, everything came true because God was the one planning the whole thing. God had determined the whole thing. That is lesson number one that we can understand. Yahweh God is the Lord of the nations. Second, we find is that there are external differences. Okay, there are external differences between these nations, but all nations belong to the same human family. See, that's what Acts chapter 17 and verse 26 says. All from one blood. Okay? God made us all from one blood. No race or people can claim to be superior to any other race or people. Okay? God has permitted some nations to make greater progress economically, to make progress politically than other nations. Some achievements of some nations would be greater. But that does not prove that they are better than others. We all, all nations belong to the same human family. 
God made us all. We are all of one blood. Okay, that's what it means. So in his providence, God has permitted some people to be financially richer or uh, economically poorer, uh, politically stronger, military-wise, you know, bigger superpower and all those things. Achievements, uh, you know, comforts, all those things vary among nations. But all nations belong to the same family. That is why we are no greater than the others. That's the second thing. Third thing that we understand is God has a purpose for the nations to fulfill. I'll say it again. God has a purpose for the nations to fulfill. See, if you look at chapter 9, verse 24, okay, chapter 9, verse 24, to chapter 11, verse 32, okay, all the descendants, the genealogies, all their names listed together. If you look at all the accounts in Genesis chapter 9, 24 to 11, 32, it makes it clear that God's chosen nation was Israel. Okay, was Israel. From chapter 12, Israel will take the center stage in the narrative. Okay. God also used Egypt. God also used Babylon. God used uh, Assyria. He used the Medo-Persian Empire. God used the Roman Empire to accomplish his purposes with reference to the Jewish people. With reference to the Jewish people. See? So, God had a purpose and has a purpose. I won't say had. God has a purpose for the nations to fulfill. And he will fulfill it in his time. He will fulfill it in his time. And it's all in relation to the Jewish people. Now, I told you, God can use pagan rulers. We see that throughout the history of Israel, God can use pagan rulers like Nebuchadnezzar. Cyrus, um, then Darius, then Augustus Caesar, every one of these kings, every one of these empires, every one of these nations can be used by God in connection with the Jewish nation, which was his chosen vessel. Chosen vessel. Okay. Now you would ask, say, why God chose Jews? Why couldn't he choose? He had to start somewhere. That's what Paul says. And he chose by grace, he chose Israel. By grace, he chose Israel. So God has a purpose for nations to fulfill. Fourth thing that we read about this in this passage is God is not only concerned with Israel. Okay, just because he chose Israel, God is not only concerned with Israel. He is concerned for all nations. God is concerned for all nations. See, if you look at the book of Psalms, okay, turn with me to the book of Psalms, chapter 66. Psalm 66, verse 1 onwards, okay, 1 to 8, if you read it, you will find here references to the universal vision which God has for all nations. No? Shout for joy to God all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him uh, glorious praise. Verse 8. Bless our God, O peoples, let the sound of his praise be heard. All nations. Okay, His focus is always on all nations. All he lands. All nations. If you check chapter 66 of Psalms and again chapter 67. You know, chapter 6 7 says may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on earth your saving power among all nations See, God chose Israel but his focus was on Israel so that he could bless all nations all nations this is shown when he chooses Abraham also God says I will choose Abraham so that I can bless all nations I can bless all nations. See, his vision is universal. His vision is global. Okay. All the nations of the earth must come to know God and serve him. So, the great commission was there even before the church was established. God's vision was the great commission. God's vision for Israel was the great commission. He wanted to reach the whole world by taking Israel, by choosing Israel. See? So God is concerned not just for Israel. He's concerned for the whole world. The church's commission is to go into all the world. Okay? But that is not a New Testament. You know, suddenly God had an idea like, okay, let us reach the whole nations. No. It is written into the pages of the Old Testament story. God has a burden for all nations. Okay. So, 
As you look at this, let us remember these four great lessons that God is teaching us this morning. First of all, Yahweh God is the Lord of the nations. Yahweh God is the God of the nations. He has given the nations their inheritance. He decides their boundaries. You know, he is the God of geography and he is the God of history. History, he is the God who is in control. Whatever he promises, he will perform it. Okay, so whatever he has planned for them will take place. He is the God of the nations. Secondly, in spite of all our external differences, all nations belong to the same human family. We are no better than each other. We are all the same. Okay, we belong to the same human family. Thirdly, God has a purpose for the nations to fulfill. With every nation, he has got a plan. With every nation, it has this is connection with Israel. But every nation, God has a plan for them. Fourthly, God is not concerned with just one nation. He chose one nation so that he could, uh, because he has concerned for all nations. The Great Commission was not an afterthought in the New Testament. It is the foundation and basis of even choosing Abraham. The promises given to Abraham reflect that he is a God who is concerned for all nations. Okay, So the mission did not originate in the New Testament. Mission was originated in God's heart even in the Old Testament. Okay, Now, Noah's three sons, they left a mixed legacy in the world. But the Lord of the nations was still in charge. And history is always his story. Okay. History is always his story. Three sons spread out, spread all over the world. God has a plan for each one of those groups. So as we look to him this, this morning, let us focus on the God who is the Lord of geography, the Lord who is the Lord of history. He is still in control. He is still in charge. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you because you are a gracious God. Your plan was to reach the nations and your gracious plan has enabled us to join here this morning. Because missionaries came and evangelized and they spread the word of God here in our nation. We have received this great salvation that God had planned. When you promised to Abraham that all nations would be blessed through him, no one knew the extent of that plan. No one knew the vastness of God's plan. As we look to you this morning, help us to see how you planned everything from then. And you charted things out so that every one of us would know you and worship you. What a great plan that you had. The way that you implemented it. The way that you went about coordinating it. Father, we have no we have no clue about how great your plans are, how vast your, your mission is. But we thank you because we are a part of that. And we are able to see it this morning that God has a plan for all nations. As this pandemic is raging and as we look to the world around us, help us to get a clear glimpse of the Lord who is in control, who is still on the throne. The God who is the God of history and the God who is the God of geography is still on the throne. Nations are moving, getting displaced. Uh, tribes are getting relocated, refugees are moving from one place to another, but you are still in control and you have a plan for the nations to fulfill before the coming of your son. Help us to surrender ourselves to your plan. Do not Let us not panic, O oh Lord, when things look to be out of control for us. Help us to know the one who has control over everything is still on the throne. We surrender ourselves to you. Help us not to consider ourselves better than others because we have known you it is simply by grace, nothing of our merit, nothing of our ancestors' merit. We all belong to the same, same family. No one is better than the other. Help us to acknowledge each other. Help us to love one another and show forth and declare to the nations the God of all nations. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.